Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our lecture number four, The Basics of Trading. This is part of our Speculate, Invest, Trade the Financial Markets from the Start to the Profit. Now, you'll start off, if you joined us for the lecture one, starting off with the basics of the financial markets, not the online trading market, but a general knowledge of all the financial markets. We're starting at a beginning and building you to where you should be so that you have all the underlying knowledge to make smart investing and trading decisions down the road. It's no different than a child when he learns to speak and learns his ABCs. First he needs to learn the sounds, then he needs to learn how to string them together, and then once he can say his ABs and Cs, he might be able to spell cat, and then hat, and then bat. And then he might be able to spell bigger words because he's learned the basics. Eventually he can string those words together to form sentences. And one day he can actually write a report. Down the road he can write his thesis. And before you know it, he's an author, a novelist, or somebody who can write detailed business analysis or reports because he understands all the basics. And this is what we're trying to get to you because too many traders come to the market thinking they know it all and don't really realize how all of this works together and why you can predict what's going to happen by seeing something else happen that's kind of far removed. So we're also going to teach you to learn to understand technical and fundamental analysis. Now in today's series, today's lecture, we're going to start moving over to the basics of trading and then our next lecture we're going to move over to market analysis and we're going to look at fundamental analysis, technical analysis, even today we're going to touch on it but the study of the markets and the study of the analysis is quite large. We're not going to teach you to this in one lecture so we're going to slowly build your knowledge base as we go through all of the types of technical analysis and fundamental analysis and how to do market analysis and to put it together to eventually start building strategies whether you're investing speculating or trading and so that you understand what is happening okay and each lecture will slowly prepare you to move forward so please watch these lectures in order because once you jump forward you're going to assume or we're going to assume you have the premise of all this knowledge and a lot of people just don't or they have great big assumptions. I'd also appreciate it greatly if you could hit the subscribe button or the bell icon. I promise you we're not going to bother you with emails. We're not going to get in touch at all. All you get is YouTube will ping you whenever I've uploaded a new class. So let's dive into lecture four, the basics of trading. Now today we're going to be working on your building blocks to success. Financial trading involves the buying and selling of financial in instruments with profit making objectives. These can be instruments like shares, forex or bonds. They can be derivatives such as CFDs, futures and options. As I mentioned or as I didn't mention I really didn't say online trading because we're not ready for online trading yet. In financial markets, millions of companies, individuals, institutions, and even governments are trying to profit from buying and selling financial instruments at the same time. This means that the price of those instruments tends to constantly be on the move. A market that moves a lot is known as a volatile market. These markets bring more opportunities for profit, but also mean higher risk. Opportunities that are volatile or that move a great deal are not necessarily good investment vehicles. So financial instruments can be bought and sold in one of two ways. They can be traded on exchanges. There are highly organized marketplaces where a particular instrument is bought and sold like the London Stock Exchange or the Wall Street Exchange, the Shanghai Exchange, okay. or they can be traded over the counter. When two parties agree to trade instruments with each other, like when you trade derivatives or CFDs, you're trading with a provider. Over the years, markets have grown bigger and faster. 
more people than ever before are now able to access these markets. Once they were only accessible to big banks, finance houses, very wealthy individuals. But now most people can access financial products to trade and invest through online platforms. When I started trading back in the 70s, we didn't have computers. We didn't have internet. We didn't have any online. We actually sat in a broker's office in his pit watching ticker tapes and hand charting and then going down to the actual pitch and, and, and doing our trading. Okay. And it was a very cumbersome way of trading, but the markets moved a lot slower. There weren't, this was back in the 70s, we were seeing the beginning of speculation. Okay. We weren't seeing trading and we did always had investing. Now, these markets are broken into different groups. Indices are one that a lot of people get confused about. Like when you read the S&P is up, you think the stock market's up, but the S&P isn't the stock market. Indices are made up of baskets of selected shares and can be traded like an individual share. So for instance, the S&P, and let's take the prominent one, the S&P 500. It is made up of the 500 largest trading instruments and there, there's criteria that go with it on the, the on the Wall Street on the, the New York Stock Exchange. Now, some of these shares go up and some of these shares go down, but the value of all those shares together, you can buy one share of the S and P 500, and it is made up of all of those stocks. Although you don't own the individual stocks, okay, and that way. If some stocks go down and some stocks go up, but the S&P went up, you still make profit. You're, you're, you're spreading your risk. Then we have things like Dow Jones Transportations, which are only transportation stocks. Well, say the markets are crashing, but transportation is doing extremely well. Well, the Dow Jones Transportations, which is made up of only transportation stocks, would also do quite well. These are indices. Okay. Examples of indices include the Dow Jones, the S&P, the DAX, the Nikkei, the CAC, the FTSE. And of course, I mentioned these are made up of equities and equities are also shares and represent the price of a share of a company that are listed on the major stock exchange, such as the London Stock Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange, or even NASDAQ. Popular shares are listed on exchanges and they include things like Barclays, Facebook, Twitter, we all pretty much understand how the shares market and how the exchanges work. Now, one of our newest members into the financial markets, which we're not sure where they're going to end up, is cryptocurrencies. A cryptocurrency is a digital asset designed to work as a medium of exchange that uses cryptography to secure its transactions, to control the creation of additional units, and to verify the transfer of assets. Cryptocurrencies are classified as a subset of digital currencies and are also classified as a subset of alternative currencies and virtual currencies. Although a lot of countries have classified them as assets, some have classified them as commodities. They may be a subset of currencies, but they're not really part of the overall currency market and they don't trade the same way that Forex necessary trades. They trade on their own exchanges. And that leads us over to the foreign exchange market. And it is also a global decentralizer over the counter market for the trading of currencies. Again, we're not talking about online trading of Forex. We're talking about Forex, foreign exchange, banks, hedge funds, companies buying and selling goods overseas are all using the foreign exchange market. So it includes all aspects of buying, selling, and exchanging currencies at current or determined prices. It is by far the largest market in the world. Then we have commodities. This is where I started my, my life trading and I traded agriculturals and then livestock. But commodity trading involves trading or investing in physical substances like oil, gold, wheat, natural gas, silver, or other softs and metals. Each commodity market will have its own particular cycle, determine the specific factors like time of harvest and demand. Traders can take positions 
based on forecasted economic trends or arbitrage opportunities in the commodities market. Then we have the bonds market, or it's referred to as the debt market, because bonds are debt instruments issued by governments or companies which have to pay interest to investors and they can also be traded. Popular bonds markets include the UK gilts and the US government 10 and 20 year bonds. But Google, which is now owned by Alphabet or Alphabet, can issue a bond, take a loan. Okay? Lots of corporations do this because they, want, they have a big project or maybe they want to buy or build a new office complex that's going to be millions and millions of dollars instead of tying up their cash or necessarily going to the bank and taking a loan they can issue bonds because their company is large enough and secure enough that their bonds are secure and it's basically a mortgage or a debt and it's a loan and their investors are buying up these bonds and these bonds are like a loan they have a predetermined interest rate an expiration date a date that they're due how the interest is going to be paid when the interest is going to be paid but say, for instance, you bought a 20-year bond from Google for a specific project. And that 20-year bond, of course, is due in 20 years. It's paying 1.75% interest because right now interest is down at zero. Okay. And so it's a good investment. But your bond is worth this. You as an investor know you're going to get 1.75% back on your money. But interest rates go up and up and up and up. Okay. Your bond is technically worth less because you've tied up that money at 1.75%. But say you tied up at 1.75% and the markets of the the interest rate market has gone down to minus 10, minus 20, and the current available rate is 1.25. Well, you've made 50 points. Okay. You can go sell your bond in the market, get your cash back, get your prepaid interest because somebody else is buying it because you made 50 points in the inter future interest. Complicated little market. But that's how governments especially issue bonds. And bonds are a huge, huge market. Now, financial markets moves are based on supply and demand. If more investors or traders want to buy a certain stock, commodity, or currency, there are those willing to sell. Then the market moves up in price until the, those buyers are able to buy. On the flip side, if more traders want to sell a stock, commodity, or currency, then there are those willing to buy. Then the market moves down until the sellers can sell. Okay. Now, we're not talking about, see, online trading is based on short-term moves, short-term in, in in balances in the market because we're looking at the euro is trading at 120, 120, 120 and the euro should be trading at 120. It might go up to, to 121 as the economy gets better. But for some reason, the euro dropped down to 119.5 right now. And you say, oh, I can buy it because it's going to bounce back up to 120, 125. So you're taking advantage of that small little range. It's not the difference in the value of the euro. It's really not even a difference of supply and demand because it's going to change and go back to where it was in a short time. So online trading is different. See, a speculator might say, oh, the UK pound is selling it, trading at one, what, whatever. I don't know what the pound was. Say at 137 to the dollar, but once Brexit is settled, and especially if it's settled favorably, the pound is gonna go up in value. So I'm gonna speculate that by December 31st, the pound is gonna be up. So I'm gonna buy it today in October and hold on to it and get rid of it right after the first of the year. You're a speculator. Okay. An investor might say, okay, I can buy the pound at 130. And I think over the next five years, the market is going to increase well, once we're past Brexit, once we're past the corona. We think the UK economy is going to soar, so the pound will go back up to 156, 158. Okay, so I'm going to invest and buy pounds and put those pounds away. Because an investor is using his cash. He's moving one asset for another. He's not using things like leverage and margin. He's buying something to hold on to. 
Now, many market participants keep tabs on news in real time. Bad news affecting a company or a country will drive prices down, for example. Even political news will have a wide reaching effect on the markets. Now, one of the biggest drivers, whether we're talking about central banks, whether we're talking about stock markets, even when we're talking about commodities, is central bank policy. It is the ultimate final decision whether the Federal Reserve or the Bank of London, the Bank of England is going to raise or drop interest rates. It affects everything anywhere. You were the guy who bought the bond. The Feds decide to raise interest rates. Interest rates go up and all of a sudden the value of your bond is a little bit less because now you've got a million dollars tied up at 1.75%, but the Feds are raising rates and you're not getting a rate increase and you could have put your money elsewhere for less money. Okay. On the other hand, you're a guy with a, a mortgage that's based on the Fed plus prime. Okay. Feds raise rate, your mortgage rate goes up. Not instantaneously, but when you're, you know, at the end of the year or the nine month period, whatever your, your recalculation period is, goes up. Lots of people have credit cards based on that. But then we have big major corporations that have lots of outstanding loans that are tied exactly to the central bank interest rate. They go up, they go down, has a big effect on what the cash flow is of a big corporation on all of its debt. So the main driver, the value of currency, is the interest rate environment in that country or zone, especially when compared to other currencies in that pair. Central banks make decisions such as setting interest rates, and these can be have profound effects on the flow of money around the world and will have a big impact on the markets. Now, let's say hypothetically, we read last year that that Google had like $10 billion in cash. Okay, well, they don't leave that cash parked anywhere making no money. Most of the most of the, this kind of money, the banks pay the the person owning that money overnight rates. Every night it sits there based on their balance, they're making interest because the banks are loaning that money either to the Federal Reserve or back to the central bank or out to other places to make money. So they make money on the rate also. So if Google's got a couple billion dollars floating around the central banks raise rates by 25 basis points, well that makes a big difference to the cash that Google's getting for their money sitting there. Now we talk about something more specific and we're going to separate this down as we go farther because there's a big difference between the other markets and company results and company earnings and how we would analyze a stock or the stock markets because it's one of the few places that puts out quarterly figures. So if the earnings of a company continue to grow and the odds are good that the stock price is also rising, companies listed on the stock exchange will release the regular results, which will encourage investors to buy and sell their shares. Because we have economic events like the central bank or jobs report or unemployment report or inflation report. All of those affect their statistical reports released by governments in most cases, but they, replay, they affect the currency, but they also affect company results. But company results don't usually affect the currency. Now, from time to time, governments will release data which can trigger market moves. Releases such as unemployment information, data on new jobs created, economic forecasts or inflation data can all give signals to investors or traders on whether to buy or sell within any given market. And this falls under the classification of fundamental analysis. And in our next class, we're going to spend some time looking and trying to understand fundamental analysis. Trading and investing can be challenging, just like most rewarding and fulfilling career paths. Every career has its own unique learning curve and how successful one is at navigating this curve is down to the individual. Now, top professionals must learn and master their skills in order to get to the very top. 
It doesn't happen overnight. Learning how to trade and invest takes time, discipline, the correct guidance, and the right attitude. Most people fail in trading because they lack proper guidance and the right education at the beginner stage. Trading is, in, trading is investing in yourself and your financial freedom to create a path of possible futures. Now, it's ultimately important and the first thing and the only thing that every investor, trader, or speculator should realize is risk. Sound risk and money management principles only allow you to put a small risk or a risk a small percentage of your capital at any given time. This means that even if the market moves against your position, your losses are limited to a small fraction of your capital and still have the most of your funds in reserve if other opportunities arrive in the market. I'll give you a funny story. A friend of mine, I wouldn't say she's a smart investor. She knows nothing about the markets. She reads about a stock in, a, you know, a, not even a financial newspaper, in the regular papers. And she watches, she hears the rumors, she hears it, and she jumps in and buys it. She actually does pretty good. And we're not talking about investing millions of dollars. Okay. But she does all right. Except this year, she, it was lemonade. Okay. And she bought lemonade a wee bit too late and it had surged at it you know when it was released it surged way 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 too high and she bought it too high it fell didn't fall down lower than his release numbers but it fell way lower okay. eventually it recovered a wee bit and she was able to get out of it with a small loss and i said to her you know what this is because what you didn't you didn't know what you were doing. So the five other stocks you had bought and sold this year that had made you profit, you lost all of that profit with one investment in lemonade. You should have bought less lemonade and you shouldn't have been so greedy that you were so sure it was gonna make you tons of money. So in other words, you negated a whole year's worth of work because she never looked at her risk. And she wasn't buying, trading. She was investing, she was putting, it was her cash in the markets in her stock. The main reason why some new traders fail to fail is because of lack of understanding or the lack of application of money management principles and techniques. Most traders utilize leverage without any knowledge of how this can wipe out trading accounts due to the magnified losses that can be incurred even during times of normal market volatility. Your strategy can focus on optimized capital growth by utilizing strict risk management principles and trading techniques, which only allows for small losses and bigger gains. Well, that sounds, oh, I mean, any of us using common sense would say, oh, that's what, you know, that's what I'm going to do. But you have to think about it. Basically, an investor, speculator, or trader spends more time looking at the potential risk of a move than they do at the possible profits. Now, financial trading allows you to profit from both rising and falling markets. Now, this can only be done with derivatives because you can't sell shares before you own them. But you can sell options. You can sell CFDs on a particular share before you own them and buy them back to close your deal. In trading, you do not have to own the actual underlying asset you are trading. You only trade the price movements and this enables you to go long or short a given asset at any given time. As a technical trader, you can make your trading decisions based on the price action of any stock, financial instrument, or trade accordingly. Now, we're, we're just gonna start, start mentioning these words. Okay, we're not really in this class going to delve too deeply because it's long and detailed and complicated. It's going to take several classes. But you can build your own trading strategy, which helps you decide when to enter and exit the market based on technical analysis. There are a wide range of technical analysis indicators and tools which can help you make informed decisions. However, it's important to backtest 
your trading strategy to ensure that you fully understand the potential risks and drawdowns that can occur when applying in the real market. So let's give you an example. Okay, stock X, Y, and Z, we used the other day as stock A, B, and C, but take stock X, Y, and Z is trading at $100. Its earnings report comes out and it's very good. Plus, retail sales figures from the government came out and they were very strong. And your, your X, Y, and Z corporations are retail, e-commerce store, uh, stores and online. Well, that tells you their stock should go up. But how would you know at what price it is worth entering the market, at what price you want to get out of the market, or how would you know when the stock is plateaued out or reached its top, or perhaps the market had already priced all this in and the price was too high? You can't get that from what we call fundamental analysis. The fundamental analysis came from the earnings report and the earnings data. And the fact is, I could tell you the stock A, B, and C was trading at 100, 100, 100 yesterday, 100, 100 today, went up to 101.42, came down, down, down to 101.40, went down to 100, went down to 99.50, back up to 99.75, back up to 102.42, back down to 99.44. Can you repeat any of that? Did any of it make any sense to you? No, because our brains can't comprehend it. So technical analysis starts out with the use of charts, which gives us a visual representation of price. All a chart is, is an actual visual, visual graphic of price. So technical analysis is a trading tool used to evaluate financial instruments and assets to try to forecast their future movement. This is done by analyzing statistics gathered from previous and current trading activity, such as price movement and volume. Technical analysis can be viewed as a process of mapping traders and investor psychology. Market action is studied mainly using price charts and indicators to project the direction of future price movements of an asset or financial instrument. Technical analysis is derived from Dow theory, which has two main assumptions. One, the market price discounts every factor that may influence a security. And market, market price movements are not purely random, but move in identifiable patterns known as trends and repeat over time. When you look at price of a financial instrument as a technical analyst, you believe that it's true value of the instrument as the market sees it. Using a technical approach, you believe that all the factors that affect price, including fundamental, political, and psychological, have all been built already into the price you see. That means that anything that can affect the price of a security has already been factored by the market participants. Technical analysis examined the charts for information on future direction of markets. Now, technical analysis sounds scary. So I, re I renamed it and I used the name chart analysis because it's everything and anything you do on a price chart. So study, so first we want to map out the trends. We want to study long-term charts, begin a chart analysis with monthly, weekly, and charts spanning several years. Because stock X, Y, and Z was at 100, okay? If you looked at the chart, you saw it top out at 140, 102.42, you come back down to 101.40, 101, back down pretty much to 100, and ended up at 101, say, but when that earnings report came out that was so positive, guess what? The market had already priced it in. The market's expected it to go from its 100 to its 101, which was a significant move. It's a 1% move for that stock. It made, so when that earnings report came out and you wanted to jump in the market without looking at a chart, you wanted to realize that most of that, most of the market participants had already pushed the stock price up. So it was maybe too late for you to get in there. Now, on a chart, we also see volume. If volume, that's the amount of stock being traded, hadn't increased, that's telling you that it was all bought because you could see that big increase in volume prior to that data release because they already knew or suspected what was happening.
So the, ter the trend and follow-up market trends come in many sizes. Long-term, intermediate-term, and short-term. First, determine which one you're going to trade and use the appropriate chart. If you're an investor, you don't want to look at a 15-minute chart or a one-day chart. Even if you're a speculator, one day, maybe. You know, an investor wants to look at a one-week chart or one month. He wants to see how that asset has been trading over a long Because he's looking at holding it, putting it away for his retirement, or maybe putting it away until next year. But he's not concerned with, is it... Can I get into it at one, one, can I get that share at $100.02? He doesn't care. He wants to predict that it's going to go up to 104 or 106 over the next year. He's buying it. He doesn't care if he buys it at 99.50 or 99.27 or 99.42. He wants to be holding it for when it gets to, it slowly makes its move up in the charts. And make sure you trade in the direction of trend, of the trend. Buy dips if the trend is up. You can sell rallies if the trend is down. If you're trading the intermediate trend, you want to use daily or weekly charts. If you're day trading, you use daily or interday charts. But in each case, let the longer range chart determine the trend and then use shorter term charts for your timing. So for instance, if you're trading, and let's take the term day trader and throw it in the trash. It doesn't really exist much anymore. If you're trading CFDs, options, you know, doing online trading, you can get in an asset and get out of it as fast as you want. Okay. Well, if we saw the stock is X, Y, and Z had dropped from its average of 100 down to 99.50 on the short-term charts, we might have bought it up because we just want to get out of it at 100, 101, 102, you know, 101 in a very short time range. So we would have looked at it in a longer term range and moved it in a medium term range and then looked at it for a very short term because we're just looking to take advantage of that volatility. If you were taking advantage of the volatility, you might have got in at 99.50 and got out at 101.42 because that was where the volatility pushed it to in expectation. And then we want to find things like support and resistance levels. It's the best play to, play to buy near is near support levels. The support level is usually a previous reaction low. The best place is to sell a market is near a resistance level. Okay, that was a bunch of words that get complicated. Simple words that get complicated. Support and resistance are the prices above and below the current price of the market where investors have had a difficult time. So when our stock X, Y, and Z, we know it's tried to push up and stay above 100. It's tried to push up and stay above 100. But it doesn't really get there. Okay. Now, some temporary short-term news pushed it up. Okay. But if we understood what the floors and the ceilings were, we can make some smart trading decisions. So if we were to say support and resistance are like the floor and the ceiling of an elevator. You step in an elevator and the elevator goes up. The floor below your feet is what's supporting you. It's pushing you through the ceilings above which is your resistance. If you knew and analyzed that building and you knew, ah, the biggest offices were on the 10th floor, well, there's a good chance that the elevator is going up to the, going to stop at the 10th floor. If you knew there was a big restaurant and lounge on the roof, roof deck, you know, and it was lunchtime or dinner time, you knew there's a good probability of that elevator stopping at the roof, that roof, you know, the lounge and, and the restaurant. So you can use this to determine levels of support and resistance. The floors above your head and the and this and the ceil the floor the ceilings above your head and the floor below your feet. And when that elevator turns to come down, it just flips them. You know, coming down, there's a good chance that elevator is going to stop at 10 because that's the biggest floor with the most employees. And those people are going to get on the elevator, and you're all going to probably go down to to either the ground level, the lobby level, the parking level, but you could determine it based on time of day. If it's evening time when all the diners and all the diners are parking underground and all the employees that are getting ready to leave park underground, there's a good chance it's not going to stop at the lobby. It's going to go down to the first or second floor of the underground parking lot. So res resistance is usually a previous peak. After resistance peaks and has been broken, it will usually provide support on subsequent pullbacks. In other words, the old high becomes the new low. 
And then we have chart patterns. All of this is the fields of technical analysis. These are only the little sectors. You have to learn them in and out because people just think that a lot of people just assume technical analysis of mathematical calculations. As you see, they're not. Chart patterns are one of the most important tool which should be utilized as part of your technical analysis. From beginners to professionals, chart patterns play an integral part when looking for market trends and predicting movements. They can be used to analyze all markets, including Forex, shares, commodities, cryptocurrencies, options, bonds, everything. Chart patterns are an interesting part of the market. I am a chart pattern price action trader. I trade from support and resistance and chart patterns. Now, in our next class, our next lecture, we're going to be looking at live charts. But today, live charts will only confuse you because we're just talking about general principles. Chart patterns often form shapes which can be help predetermine price action, such as stock breakouts and reversals. Recognizing chart patterns will help you gain a competitive advantage in the market and using them will increase the value of your future technical analysis. Before starting your chart pattern analysis, it's important to familiarize yourself with the different types of chart patterns. And we're going to just touch them, like I said, real fast today. We're going to spend a, you know, a whole class looking at the different chart patterns and how to use them and how to use triangles to make trading decisions, how to build them in your strategies. But before you can look at chart patterns, you have to understand the different types of charts. So the first type of chart we have is a line chart. Line charts are the simplest type of chart. They really do us no good because they use, basically they use the close of each time session and you put a dot on a, on, the, on a piece of paper, connect those dots together and you have a line chart. From here we go to my favorite type of charting and which was the market's favorite type of charting for a very, very, very long time. And that's called the bar chart or OHLC, open, high, low and close. It's been replaced today by the Japanese candlestick, candlestick charts, because candlestick charts were the most complex type of charting to do by hand. So when I started trading and all traders were, we didn't have computers, we didn't have any of this. So we sat with graph paper making charts. Okay. So we all use bar charts. It was easy to draw a line with your pencil, put an open, the high, the low and the close. A candlestick uses the exact same pieces of information. But a candlestick chart is very much like a bar chart. But like bar charts, the candlestick's highest wick is the highest price in that period, and the lowest wick is the lowest price. We do have a lot of time spent on candlesticks in our lecture series. The candlestick body represents the difference between the open and the close, which can help to indicate price movement. So as you see here on the chart, Candlesticks are done today mostly in reds and greens. And too many traders make the assumption a lot of red means to sell, a lot of green means to buy, but it doesn't. Okay. Candlesticks are about the size of the body of the candle, the length of the wicks of the candle, and its position in the candle before and the candle afterwards. So the candlestick is red or green subject to bullish or bearish movement. A bullish movement is an up is in an uptrend or an up for that candle time, while a bearish movement shows a downtrend or in that period of the candle. Many chart patterns can represent, be represented best on candlestick charts. So I'm not gonna spend time explaining them, but I'm gonna go over the most popular types of chart patterns because then we have an entire lecture on chart patterns. But we have what's called ascending triangles, descending triangles, we have symmetrical triangles. Now, I, again, I'm a triangle trader. I don't care the difference between a symmetrical triangle, asymmetrical triangle, a descending triangle. That's just memorizing patterns and what you're supposed to do when you see those patterns. Ultimately, it comes to, as a pattern forms and the price gets pushed into an apex, you're gonna get a breakout. Nobody can predict whether the breakout is gonna be breakout up or breakout down. Nobody can predict the confirmation of that breakout. But there are ways to do that and then how to use the width of that triangle to figure out where to put your stop loss how to use the width of the base of the triangle to figure out your target point okay and how to see this breakout are very important we also have pennants and flags 
fancy names for shapes on a, on a chart where the triangle forms. Again, I just dump them all into triangle. And then we have things like double bottoms. Okay. I don't trade from double bottoms. Some people do. It's two times something happens and I don't, it's not enough verification for me. We have double tops. Then we have a very famous pattern called the head and shoulders pattern, which takes a long time to develop and works very good for investors and for longer term traders or speculators because it's quite reliable and it looks just like the head and shoulders of a person. Now chart patterns can sometimes be difficult to identify in charts when you're a beginner and even when you're a professional trader. Once you are comfortable locating them, you will find that they will increase your trading success. So that's a wrap for today. And I promise you, we're going to go into all the detail over the next lectures. So like I said, little by little, we're going to gain you the basic knowledge and build on that premise that you have a solid understanding. So thank you very much. And we'll see you in our next class. Bye now.